Hi, guys. My, my guest today is uh, Ivan, a truly expert and, uh, you know, uh, um, all hands crafter of mobile technologies, starting from iOS, Android, Cordoba, Flutter, pretty much anything that's out there in the definition of mobile technology, he has touched and, um, and is go-to expert in Berlin. And I'm very happy to have you here, Ivan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for hosting me today, Sergei. Yeah, and you know, like it, this is very passionate topic of many people. If we talk about future of mobile technology, it's probably worthwhile actually start with the history, how this whole thing started. And I, if I just walk through from, um, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know when when you were born. I was born in the '80s, so back then we didn't have we didn't have mobile phones. It was a dream of mine to have one. But historically, actually, the the evolution of first G started in the 80s. It started in Japan, but then has been rolled out to US and Euro European market. Um, and just like, you know, to walk everyone through, we, we are right now rolling out 5G. Is that correct, Ivan? Kind of, maybe not in the all regions of our planet, but yeah, definitely the 5G is the standard that's going to be the first for the next at least 10 years or something like this, yeah. But uh, to bring everybody on board, uh, so first G is like first generation was introduced in 1979 or 1980s, and we call it analog way of uh, communicating. Then the second G uh, started in 1990, and everybody who was already born after 1980s, we remember that GSM standards was, was introduced in, in Europe and uh, that's the time when uh, everybody remember Nokia as a great phones having in their pockets. Then 3G uh, was kicked off in 2000. And this is a time where uh, broadband became available. So the calculation minutes uh, versus kilobytes or, or kilobits became a standard. So because we started to look at data, um, in exactly in this time, 3G, the iPhone was uh, released in 2007, and it changed everything. Um, 4G uh, is a measured transition from um, the transistors, well, the, the, the switch ports into the IP network setup. So this is why 4G is called native IP network, because then every device and network was already considered to be isolated computer. And right now we are in the 5G and the breakthrough of 5G is basically availability of high band data with promised one gigabit per second uh, data transfer where, and this is, this is when, this is where uh, device becomes basically data agnostic because you could pretty much do anything on, on your device on, on your client side, because the, the internet is basically right there right now. Um, Ivan, what was your first experience with uh, with mobile technology? So for sure, I was born a bit later than you, so I was born in 1992. So, and for me, 2G was standard I firstly faced. And of course you mentioned the GSM, but I remember these times in the late 1990s, right? There were like multiple standards on the market. So there was a separate standard in the US and uh, the GSM, the European one, but in the area I was grew up, so there were like also the Delta standard, the forest standard, like really multiple starters, standards that were fighting for a supremacy action. And uh, in then the GSM one, so, and actually it's, uh, it's quite weird because it was not the best one, but my, maybe the cheapest one actually. <laughs> so um, then you see that economy really beats the quality sometimes. And uh, of course, and the Nokia, you mentioned Nokia, the Nokia was are producing not only the GSM phones, because my parents uh, used to have the Delta, used to use the Delta standard and Nokia Deltas. So um, that's why like, the Nokia itself was quite popular in general. So they really were producing multiple phones for multiple standards uh, for multiple reasons, actually, because uh, the GSM was mostly for cities. It was really great in cities. So uh, the better, actually, one of the things in the standard was SMS, I guess. That's the thing that really, that everything actually, uh, because, uh, yeah, somehow the text messages became really popular in the, exactly in the second generation of the networks. 
and that's how the GSM became popular in general across the world. Yeah. And Ivan, if you know, like you know, SMS, obviously, you know, the communication. This is what what you know what was the main purpose of mobile devices. But uh, coming back to something that we know, uh, mobile mobile apps. What is con what is considered to be the first like mobile app? It's pretty hard to. Uh... To tell me about it, because yeah, we have to define what the mobile device is, right? So you mentioned that the first generation of the uh, network was launched in 1979, right? So the uh, somewhere in Japan, the first actual phone was introduced, the commercial one, right? It was introduced by Motorola even earlier in 1973. So and since then, the phone was like it was a mobile phone, not a mobile device phone. And since then, the main purpose of the device was like, to actually call, right, to make a communication. Then with GSM, it was about, okay, and with pagers, of course, are, okay, now I can also send some text, but it was mostly about interacting between people. And I guess that was Nokia who introduced the first, they decided to go for an interesting, really, concept. Okay, I now have a device, and what I can do else with it, right? Not only to call, but maybe to interact with a particular device. Uh, they created a snake, the first game, so it was late 90s, so, and I didn't have the phone yet this time, but I remember, like, my schoolmates were playing this game. I was, like, <laughs> extremely jealous. I also wanted to play this game. Yeah. Really, really great. Kind of the same as Tetris, but for mobile, you know, <laughs> also quite I, catchy. I, I remember, well, it was already in my time when everybody had these Nokia's in their pockets, and they were like snake competitions and I was already a student, yes. student back then, like, you know, having the higher score would instantly put you on a, on the leaderboards and like, you know, have this moment of pride. Okay. Like, you know, how quick my finger reaction is and uh, great time, but you know, like you've mentioned really interesting things. So evolution of mobile technology goes hand in hand with evolution of human habits. So initially communication, yeah. basically making a call, the next step, sending a message and then the next step okay you know i could do more and then the whole idea of applications after basically snake after so the snake was released in 1997 it took exactly 10 years uh for the apple to be released so we have a snake and then involvement of the mobile technology then apple is released and apple changed everything because of an apple store so i've just looked up uh, on the internet uh monthly apple releases in the uh apple store more than a thousand so to be precise 1100 new new apps google is a lot like you know behavior in that they they they're throwing yes. on the market close to 3000 applications uh per month <laughs> and the snake was started pretty much like as a single based uh application that you could use on your on your phone uh and if, if we talk in this con context of future of mob mobile, what do you think is going to happen? And actually, you know, you, you sitting in all, all of these technologies on a daily basis, what can you share from your observation of human habits and, uh, and mobile apps? So you're trying to predict uh, the next TikTok, right? <laughs> Well, TikTok, so, tick, tick, TikTok is already basically because it's a, it's yet another app. Yeah. But uh, what I actually what, what I see, I don't know if this is. I think we have roughly ten years difference. I don't know. I was born in nineteen eighty. You were born when? Nineteen ninety two. It's roughly like you know ten ten years difference. So my age was kind of telephone native. So we were still using the phones and calling. Right now. Like I, I, observing my kids, my, my, my daughter is at 13. She would never call anyone. You know, she is basically like, why would she call? Like she, it's, she called it cringy. Like, oh, why people call me? So they, uh, they consume this, uh, you know, communication on the phone in a to totally different context. So it's rather, rather observing or content consumption. But, you know, the original purpose of calling is not there anymore. Would you agree with me? Totally. So yeah, there is no more calling. Um, I would say I'm not also the person who actually calls anyone anymore. So I 
one of these persons who like, you know, voice messages and video messages actually. So I send them are uh, because it's just easier for me to send things. And yeah, and the next big thing, um, my bit is around the new type of contact actually, uh, con yeah. New mm -hmm. type of the, you know, video, maybe voice, stuff like this. And, uh, the TikTok actually introduced just a new way of just getting this contact, right? So like, or uh, as a user before that, there were like another platforms and the next big thing will be somewhere, somewhere around there, maybe not, uh, not a bigger, maybe something, something else, maybe some AR, right? Maybe some VR technologies, maybe some games or something like this, but anyway, so, um, something catchy, something that will let you get more content in a short period of time. So that would be it. interesting. Uh, Ivan is, uh, Apple vision pro. Is that, uh, yet another phone? Like, can we talk about this, uh, immersed technologies with augmented sure. realities in the arts as an evolution of yet next iPhone? Actually, here we have to really scroll back into what we define a mobile mobile device, right? So, and we have to come to the philosophy that currently the big companies are given to developers, essentially to product people. So, and let's take a look what the mobile device right now mean, right? In the 90s, in our childhood, so the I mean, mobile device was actually a thing that has a battery, or some connection, like the wireless connection, sometimes to sometimes to Wi-Fi, but I guess Wi-Fi was introduced a bit later. Like anyway, mostly mobile connection, a really small screen, and the main thing is super super small power. So that's why that was a mobile device. Uh, during the years, the mobile devices became as fast as the actual laptops, right? So right now. I have a laptop with like the latest Apple processor, I can too, and I have a same in my iPad and have a bit decreased version of my iPhone. So the power is more or less the same. So it means this goes out, right? And uh, the only thing that I currently have from, you know, previous mobile devices is just actually smaller screen, but it's already quite big, right? So for example, my, my MacBook, right, has the same, more or less the same size as my iPad, right? That is all the same. And uh, what else? It has a battery. Yeah, for sure. But laptops also have batteries. Uh, the only difference between mobile device and desktop device right now is, okay, the personal computer. Let's call it personal computer because there are, of course, servers. Uh, personal computer is just a connection to a network, to a connection to 4G and 5G, especially, right? So, and the AR is just one more mobile device. It's not a replacement of something. It's just one more device in a series of different mobile devices you currently have in the market. Like from small watches or even like in Brussels so taking your temperature or whatever are the physical activity things to phones, tablets, big laptops, and now like, you know, VR thing. It's not yet that autonomous as we wanted to have it. It's not like uh, we can go away for a couple of hours. We can sit to uh, cross Atlantic flight and work there. It's more like mobile anyway. So it supports mobile applications, at least how it was announced. Most mobile applications, not desktop ones. So let's see how it will be evolving, to be honest. I'm and quite enthusiastic about this, but um, as everything with Apple, first generation is always that something you have to test, understand how it will be working in some future, but sure, it shouldn't be something like production ready, right? But you know, like being in a steam engine, so you, you, you basically, you, you not only are staying on a consumption side, but you, you, you develop experiences, you're building stuff, you, you, you're making sure that we have this unified experience on all kinds of mobile devices. But what has changed in terms of technology from, you know, when you start being a let's say mobile developer mm -hmm. or, you know, like a developer that uh, tailored his skills for mobile devices towards the world where we pretty much have mobile devices across 
uh, any landscape of uh, you know consumption, as you mentioned, VR sets, uh, uh, laptops, uh, tablets, iPads, uh, even I like uh, yeah I watch yeah, I watch is also basically the the mobile device. Yeah. So how 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 this how this evolve? Uh, the simple answer the simple answer would be the development experience uh, is becoming completely device and platform agnostic. Right now, uh, both Apple and Google and all other like you know cross functional tools they are providing a way to you know write even UI ones and to run it seamlessly on all possible platforms this technology supports. So previously, then I started doing some iOS development, the native one. So it was, I don't want to say extremely hard, but it was quite difficult to adopt your iOS application for iPad. You had to write really separate code for iOS, separate for, like, for iPhone, separate for iPad. Uh, when the uh, Apple Watch releases are used uh, separate for or at least UI code for Apple Watches. And right now with newest technologies, it's almost the same. Same code, same UI, same components. Everything is reusable, just small things here and there to work with particular like, hardware tools, mostly not the software tools. Right. And now that we already have some introduction to mobile technologies, you know, I would love to uh, step through the history of actually what has changed for development experience or how do how do we develop applications and how we develop in the past? Maybe you could share some, you know, basically basic steps to bring everyone on board. Um, like in the early stages of uh, modern mobile development, right? So uh, for the modern operation systems like iOS, Android, and maybe we can touch Symbian a bit, like the one of the first Nokia systems. But in general, in the early stages, they were really different. So starting from iOS, maybe like the most popular system for development, like in the early stages, it was more like the same for Mac OS. Actually, the whole iOS has an interesting history, right? So, you know, the Apple was not in Apple for some time. Uh, Steve Jobs was not, not in Apple in some time, right? And then he joined back, but in this gap, he had a company called uh, Next Step, right? So doing the same things, creating laptops, like personal computers, and a separate operation system called Next Step. And while moving back to Apple, he actually acquired the company. Like the by Apple, Apple acquired the next step, right? And the operation system for this next step computers became a ground base for macOS, for modern macOS. And actually, you can even find it inside the code base. There are like still, still prefixes and as prefixes for some classes here and there, it's like from really early 90s. <laughs> And they were not thinking about how to do the mobile devices that, right? So they, okay, they, there was some you know, Newton computer in Apple or something like this, but in the day, uh, the whole idea about development was, okay, let's do some desktop applications. And or maybe we all remember Delphi, right? With all this, uh, as close with like, you know, the graphic reductor where you have to program with a mouse you know, literally put, uh, like you have a screen and you have to put elements on a screen using mouse, you can have a really graphical editor. And that's actually the iOS developments uh, since today. I mean, Apple introduced a new way how to do it a couple of years ago, but um, if we need to support all the operation systems, that's how it looks. You have a like, visual editor, it's called, uh, how does it call? I, I already forgot how it's called. It's called the Interface Builder. That, that's how it's called. It's the same for Mac OS and iOS, it was iPad OS, for everything. And then you connect your pieces of code and it runs. So that's how it is. For Android, it was something between uh, this approach and HTML. So 
uh, there is a preview. You can also do some mouse draggings, but actually you have the physically readable format, the XML format for this. Uh, there you can just put your elements here and there, and it will work. And of course, Android can be run not only on small, like by design, it was uh, created to run not only on small devices, but on the big ones. And you can find the Apple, like uh, not uh, Apple, sorry, the TVs with Android uh, operation system in there. And uh, since then, some of Android developers still doing the same. Like, But uh, for Sinbin, one of the things, one of the problems was like, there were no useful ID, you no know, useful environment to create applications. So, and both Apple and Google, they decided to invest some time in the development experience to get some, you know, developers to create applications. So, and the languages were okay, I would say. It was okay, Objective C for um, iOS, but Objective C is is more or less readable language. And the Java was chosen for Android also by the reason, okay. Java is a language that a lot of developers are able to, you know, to interact. So, and we can onboard as many developers as we want. But for Symbian, it was C++ actually, one of the oldest standards of C++. It was extremely hard. And just for everyone, Symbian it was the, the language that was used uh, for uh, Nokia development. Yes, it's a Nokia. It's kind of a competitor of iOS out of the beginning, like the first versions of iOS and Android from Nokia. Actually, it was a good operation system, so but not that evolved uh, comparing to iOS and Android. And of course, the development experience was quite poor. Re writing C++, maybe not the best thing. And a couple of years ago, at least maybe not a couple of years ago, it's close to be 10 already soon. So Google decided to uh, go radical about uh, Let's think how to write mobile applications that will be, um, sorry, uh, how to write mobile applications that uh, will be working equally on all operation systems from one code base. There were a lot of experiments before it, for example, to run some web code that that code didn't look natively. Also to write some bridges to the native components, it's called Currently, it's called React Native. So React Native is basically you have a, some piece of a code that binds and calls some native components in runtime and tries to appear. Yeah, it looks sometimes natively, some sometimes not. Google decided, okay, let's uh, write the whole graphic library of each platform from scratch. So, and that's how Flutter was created, actually. And a Flutter is a, it's not native for, by our understanding. So, if you run an Flutter application, uh, there is not even a single native element on the screen, but it looks the same. And you have the same feeling, same animations on the, each operation system, but it's like written from scratch by Google. And so you have- So let me stop, stop for a second, just, you know, bring everybody to the same context. So you, uh, uh, when we were using the uh, purely native languages like Symbian, Objective-C, or uh, uh, Java for Android world, we were invoking, uh, in, in, in invoking the, the native elements of the device. So the, the, the device was responsible for graphic uh, representation of, of the code. So like, you know, if, we, if we're talking about some layouts, buttons, uh, the commands of the program were sent to device and device would, you know, apply the analogy to basically draw it on the screen with, uh, with the next step, what you've mentioned, uh, react native. So react native would actually trigger native elements to be displayed on the screen with flutter. It's already next step further. It's basically, there are no native libraries. It's basically a representation of, uh, uh, flutter code on the screen, but looks like that looks like a native elements. Is that yep. correct? Yes, that's exactly like this. But the main thing together with Flutter, they moved to a new concept, concept of how building mobile applications. So if you're familiar with like, you know, declarative UI development, like for example, the React framework is following this, right? So you are not building anything in some interface builders anymore. So 
the whole application is written using one language. So if you write Flutter, it's Dart, so it's a Google language, and you write your you are using Dart, you write your network layer, you write everything using Dart. So you don't need to go and you know interact with any other things. Why Dart? Like you know, like I remember I remember when they just released it. At least in Berlin community, it was extremely hard to find anybody who would have experience with Flutter because Dart is not a common language that's used in startups. So, and I was asking, like, you know, Google had an option to actually go left and right. I don't know, pick something like more common, like Go, or, or, or even use the same thing that we did with Android to remain with Kotlin and Java. Why, why Dart? The official, okay, there is no official answer, right? So, or the rumors are quite. Uh, Quite simple. We wanted to have something in house, so some in house language, not some third party one, because uh, Google had some issues with Java historically because of you know the rights on Java, so with Oracle, and uh, they wanted to have something in house to not face the same issues, and also because Dart was developed as okay, it, the Dart language was created to. To make a replacement of JavaScript, one more language, right? So let try to replace JavaScript. Till now, uh, regretfully not. And Dart was created for you know, front-end development from the beginning, kind of. And also, the time they started development with Flutter, Kotlin was not on their radar. But they kind of said that if we knew, if we would know that uh, Flutter would be that popular, we would start doing uh, uh, not Flutter. So the uh, we Kotlin. know that Kotlin would be that popular, would start doing on Kotlin. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's exactly what we did, uh, what they did for Android. But now we are coming to the next stage of native development. A uh, couple of years ago, both Google and Apple kind of really, almost in one year, they decided to present their new way of development uh, UI. Same concept. Let's not do any uh, UI builders. Let's just write one single code base on one language. What we what will be working equally on all our platforms. For uh, for the Apple uh, calls it Swift UI, so it's uh, a framework for Swift that can be run on all Apple platforms. And some platforms are right now like at least some tools are only Swift UI specific, you're not able to write applications without Swift UI for these platforms. For example, I guess Apple Watch, that's a system where you have to already write on Swift UI only, something like this, at least the new versions. And that's where you come into this phase where like the development becomes really platform agnostic, at least from vendor perspective, right? But Google did the same. Uh, Google did the same and introduced Jetpack Compose. Looks completely similar to Swift UI and Flutter, uh -huh. actually. Same concept, same everything, but written on Kotlin. And the Jetpack Compose is currently supporting Android and web. And because Kotlin is developed by JetBrains, JetBrains is also investing a lot of time right now to support iOS and to write kind of to replace Flutter, I would say. Uh -huh. So, and it's funny that Google really, pre Google really invests times in really completely competing projects inside Google now together with JetBrains because Scotland belongs to JetBrains. So, but uh, the whole concept of development is that let's create one single code base on one language, which will be running equally on all possible platforms. And they actually achieve this. But still, it's uh, on, it's it's not platform agnostic. So the Jetpack Compose would tailored for uh, Android uh, ecosystem, and Swift UI would is tailored to uh, Apple ecosystem, or okay, because so Jetpack Compose, uh, as I said, it supports that already. You can run the same code written for Android just in that page. It will, uh -huh. it will just. Uh, Transfer, or like not transfer, transform code from Kotlin to JavaScript. There is a compiler that uh, 
called Kotlin to JS. So it will convert to JavaScript and it will be run so on that page. For iOS, it's in alpha right now, but it will create you a good UI, not really native. It will look like Flutter. So just elements uh -huh. will look native, but won't be native. Uh -huh. So, and it will run on iOS device. So, but that means Ivan, that Flutter doesn't have a future. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it looks like, you know, if with, with this, if Jetpack Compose could be a platform, platform agnostic, and there is a already quite a large community of Kotlin developers able to basically take it over and bring it to the next step from alpha to beta, et cetera, then Flutter, well, maybe it's a different, it's a different <laughs> style because I think, I think Flutter is uh, what the main concept is, uh, regardless on device type, the, the experience is going to be unified. So you could, you could have the same experience on the, on, mm -hmm. on the, on the watch app and the mobile. Not even this, but even more. So there is a bit of difference between Flutter and uh, Kotlin. The whole thing about Jetpack Compose and Kotlin running and Kotlin nodes, things called Kotlin Multiplatform. And there is already a project, live project called Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. So that will let you have a single business logic for your mobile apps written once on Kotlin for um, Android, it will be compiled in Java bytecode. For iOS, it will be compiled in native code because the iOS doesn't have any Java machine in there. And uh, Flutter works differently. It compiles once. It's always a binary. So it's like single binary that works everywhere. On web, it works a bit differently. That would Let's put the web aside. So uh, sometimes it works with uh, WebAssembly, sometimes it transfers to JavaScript, transforms things. But uh, in general, on desktop, and also Flutter supports Windows, Linux, Mac OS, it supports not only uh, already out of the box, it supports not only the mobile versions, the mobile operation systems and web. So, and it started much earlier. So that's why I don't think. Kotlin will completely remove Flutter in the next you know, couple of years, five years. Too many things already are written in, on Flutter. And it works that stable. And for some companies, having one binary would be much preferable than having one code base, but compiled differently for different platforms. So it's a matter of choice. So that's why this slight difference can lead to you know, having, having both projects alive at least for some time. Ivan, and what you just mentioned is great, but if I look at the overall ecosystem and at least at simplicity of uh, languages to start uh, your uh, learning journey, JavaScript has been and still is uh, like, you know, uh, one of the most popular language, uh, well, compared to, compared to Python or something, you know, like something that is, at least what I see in the modern ecosystem, and at least what I remember when I when I started to to to, to learn um, being a developer, we we've, we've started the journey always with HTML, CSS, and the next evolution was uh, JavaScript. And nobody nobody expected that JavaScript became so much powerful with the ability to also create uh, a, a backend side application with not uh, with Node.js and um, and also React Native becoming a, a go-to standard to create this so-called hybrid technology, which you mentioned before, that able to run a unified experience with a single, a single code base on Apple and on Android ecosystem. Could you linger a little bit on that topic if you believe like at all that Java is still worth, JavaScript is still worth learning and investing time? First of all, uh, the JavaScript currently goes together with TypeScript. So I would say the JavaScript is becoming kind of the intermediate language right now. So for example, or the Kotlin and Java, they are both compiled in the bytecode. So, and JavaScript is kind of this, or, you know, the 
the TypeScript is kind of to compile it into the uh, JavaScript. So uh, Kotlin is compiled in JavaScript and all these kind of things. That's why I truly believe that this language will be with us for uncomfortable, uncountable amount of years, but more like an intermediate language. So something that uh, other languages will get, be compiled into. And uh, if you're talking about React Native, there's still a lot of applications and even new applications that are starting with React Native. It's good technology, it works, it's still supported, it's open source, and uh, especially it's oriented for web developers because both Kotlin, Flutter, and all those things, they are mostly oriented for mobile developers, right? So because it's they're bringing mobile nature of some particular platform to all other platforms and desktop platforms and also to web. So if you want to have some web, but a React Native gives a possibility for any web developer actually to create a mobile app. And I know like, by my experience of talking to different you know, customers that they don't really have mobile developers specific because it's quite pricey, right? So to hire uh, specific developers and because their applications are not like mobile applications are not that heavy, so they don't really use any like hardware of a particular device. They actually present a more useful website, right? Or mostly oriented uh, for mobile experience websites. So that's why they just adopt uh, their websites using React Native and it works for them and brings tons of flutters for them, for the businesses. That's why I don't see any, any reason why it will disappear. <laughs> So am I right to uh, summarize that, you know, if you have a startup with limited budget, those, you don't have like, you know, heavy pockets to hire uh, native developers or, you know, like uh, ability to spread up your development uh, productivity to one platform or the other. And your idea is simple that you don't need to bring something like, you know, crazy to mobile device, but keep it to the consumption part. React Native is a good choice for picking that technology. Yes, yes. Right. Especially for prototyping, it's a perfect choice. So it works, it will give you quite native experience because you know, native elements are used. And I personally, I used a couple of React Native applications like you know, on my device. And after a couple of years, I somehow could understand that they are not native, they are React Native. There were a couple of bugs and glitches here and there. So, oh, it's not really native, but the feeling was really like, oh, it's a good application written natively. So that's why React Native can be good. And I know there are a lot of, uh, like, I don't want to say haters, but people who are not really uh, into investing sometime. But as, as you mentioned, for startups, why not? But I would say the main thing for startup is to define the main area. If they, if they are like, you know, main product is a website or web application, and they would like to bring it to the mobile device, it's one thing. But if they're, or this, the startup itself is around the mobile experience and web is something as a bonus, right? Maybe mobile backend, for example, I would recommend something closer to Flutter. Maybe I know a lot of banks are currently investing in Flutter. They're like really modern banks who are writing their applications on Flutter and it works. So why not? And only if you need to have a, if you have a lot of platform specific code, maybe working with augmented reality on iOS or working with some ML on Android because ML on iOS is different. In that case, it will be yeah much easier to have a native development because oh. or even with this Flutter development, sometimes you need to create some native code for iOS and for Android because of these differences on the platforms. And uh, sometimes if there are that many differences, instead of having two teams, you have three teams, team for shared code, team for iOS code, team for Android. So that's why here there's also, also should be a balance to understand how much shared code you actually have in your project. Uh, Ivan, you also mentioned uh, kind of like, you know, hybrid technologies. You mentioned Cordoba, and yes. I remember there was like a phone gap before. What are those? Mm. They're 
actually a website, <laughs> almost nothing. It's a, it's a website and your application and your application uh, will look like just a website, web page, uh, mm -hmm. and web. But uh, the main thing that Cordova and Pongap, all these technologies provide is an kind of an ability to call native methods. So all these libraries are just bridges. So for example, I want to call some, as, as I mentioned, augmented reality. So it will provide you a way how to call a native Swift code or native Kotlin code on Android and just run it inside the same application. And then to get the answer back to web. Is that similar to progressive web app? Uh, uh, a bit. Yes, it's a bit similar. Yeah. And of course, all the code, all the web code is inside the application. So it's, it doesn't go to some website. It can go to some website for sure, right? To some, I don't know, some URL, some server, right? But in general, all the code is embedded inside the application and it can even run without um, internet. So that's a benefit. <laughs> Right. Uh, Ivan, I would love to ask you about, um, because, you know, there are al always these talks, you know, like with the development of uh, technology, we should be like backend driven. So the, the mobile devices should only consume um, content that is calculated uh, and presented by backend. With the, on the other hand, mobile devices become a lot more powerful. So you could yes. do a lot of calculations and processing on the device. Um, what is your view on that? Like in which direction are we moving forward? Or maybe like, let me just ask you like this very stupid question from my side. Devices like uh, Apple Vision Pro, mm -hmm. where is this like, you know, because like I, I believe that with, ab with ability to 5G to deliver such a uh, like broadband right in your device, then obvious choice for calculation, CPU, GPU, and everything else would rather be outstaffed uh, to backend services. So theoretically, your device is just basically a fancy screen that's right there yes. and displays the element. But I would love to get your first point of view on that. Uh, the simple answer would be, it goes to all possible directions right now. For some businesses, it's called server-driven UI, right? So then you have actually almost everything on a backend and backend sends you just what to show, actually. Almost almost a picture to show, right? Almost a video, but okay, not like this, but uh, actually the set of elements what to present with content. And it's possible, yeah, and that means uh, the logic is needed to be implemented only one time. Kind of the same reason uh, why they cross platform development was created. We don't want to recreate logic multiple times on different operation systems for web, for iOS, for Android, for anything else. Uh, but at the same time, uh, because of that powerful uh, end devices, right? A lot of calculations can be done on them and it's becoming just cheaper because I spent quite a lot of years in advertisement, so mobile advertisement. And it was almost uh, like we had to do a lot of calculations on the client side, because if we would do them on the backend side, so the cost, the price of the art would be dramatically small because we had to pay quite a lot of so for usage of the services, right? Of our other services. So that's why it's really dependent on the business. If you want to save and you have something, want to save some money and uh, you want to get more profit and you have like not a not a huge price for your service right you can move everything to uh, mobile and to web whatever because it will not cost you anything so but it's specific scenarios right or if you want to have some really great user experience because for sure um, the fragmented reality right so imagine that you would send each single picture to the backend and then draw on top. So the, the delay would be really dramatic anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not anyhow close to more than hundred, uh, you know, the actual images on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So that's why there's still things here and there. And that's why I think 
the market is really going in both directions, it is great. So it means there is a room for all kinds of developers and all kinds of initiatives we want to bring. And, you know, just to wrap it up with, um, because like I, we live now in the uh, AI era and uh, it's worth asking, do you leverage, for example, things like Copilot in your day-to-day -day work? Have you tested? Yes, yes, for sure. And it works kind of the same as for others, for JS here, it works great. So there are tons of, or on Git, okay, Copilot was mostly created on GitHub repos, right? So there are tons of uh, Swift, Kotlin, Java, Objective-C, TypeScript repos. So the result is quite the same. It works and it works great. So if, if, if we, if we, you know, finish this off with like, uh, tips and tricks from Ivan for uh, devel developers or newbies out there. So I, if I would just ask a question, would you recommend a newbies to use a copilot on day-to-day -day work? So I'm, I'm, I came from quite strict education system, right? So where you had to write code on a paper, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> and it was done on purpose. So you really had to remember all the things and you had to understand what you're writing without any code completion and all the stuff. So I would say, yes, for sure. It will make the life easier of any developer to use a copilot. But if you really want to understand how these things work, so it makes sense to do things, you know, manually still. Any any other tools that you could uh, recommend for newbies or for anybody who would like to transition from I don't know web development to mobile development or cross? What is your idea? Are you on a VS Code or there is something else used by uh, uh, and, and for other communities? Oh, it's Android Studio. So for Android and Flutter, it's uh, Xcode, and there is no alternative. There are no alternative uh, for iOS because UpCode was deprecated regretfully. There was an alternative ID from JetBrains, but they deprecated it. So, and it's the yes code for everything else. Yeah, That's mm -hmm. free, free instruments. But yeah, if you want to go for any uh, cross platform development, uh, it will require installing both Xcode and Android Studio. So, mm -hmm. anyway, and the yes code for everything else. So, it's kind of a regular setup. <laughs> Are there any tools that uh, really leverage your productivity, productivity on a day to day basis? Apart from I have, Slack. To I have to confess, I use ChatGPT a lot. <laughs> ChatGPT, great. You know, I actually use it on a daily basis and mainly, yeah. and mainly this leverage my ability to be a great father because I do mm. homework for my kids and they, they're going <laughs> through this, you know, algebra and things or physics or chemistry and, and formulas that I never remember. And it just spills me out uh, right in a context. And the best thing about ChatGPT that it remembers a set of questions that you asked before. Ivan, and uh, if you look at the, the things that evolving uh, like recently, it's something that make you feel passionate about mobile technology, what could you share with us and with the community about like uh, things that just came out recently and you, you think it's worth mentioning here? I'm not sure about recently, but yeah, of course, the whole investment in the augmented reality from Apple is really, really great. So, and if you do have a chance to work with it, any augmented reality that would be a platform for you. And of course, all the things that are happening right now with are a med on device, maybe not that great as ChatGPT for of course, mobile device, but also all the tools are there. So you can experiment and do the really, really great stuff on mobile. And maybe one important thing that the uh, languages that are currently like working on the, on the mobile systems, most probably on most evolved languages, right? And if you're really a fan of, you know, learning languages or writing good code, so the mobile platforms will be interesting for you because yeah, both Swift and Kotlin are completely amazing languages. And also Dart is evolving. And right now Dart is way different than it was like 10 years ago. So, and even looking at the, any ratings, the, Rating self satisfaction, the languages of mobile operation systems, like they are on top because they are evolving, becoming better, I would say even each month. So the mobile industry is the most growing 
like if you take a look at last 15 years so it it will not stop because anyway the mobile technologies are on our fingers so it will not go away Ivan, it's a great summary for basically, uh, you know, bringing the commerce to your uh, to day to day work. It's a, it's the greatest uh, and the most growing industry, and it's worth joining that as, as well. So I'm I'm very happy to have uh, Ivan on our podcast and uh, you know describing this uh, going going deeper into uh, something that we use on a daily basis, but uh, not always thinking you know what is behind this be, be, behind our fingers. Yep. And um, if you would like to ask some private questions or get more information for, about uh, mobile technology or uh, reach out to Ivan, I'm going to le- leave his uh, LinkedIn um, description and any link that he would like to share in the description of the podcast. And if you enjoy this talk, yeah, please subscribe and looking forward to bring more into this uh, soft podcast. Thanks a lot, Ivan. Great. Thank you. Happy Take to. care. Ciao. Bye-bye.